Alrighty, friends. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anything that anybody would like to share uh, from this discussion that came up for you? Uh, yeah, Laura. It's not really sharing anything, but something I was wondering about is the whole uh, difference between well, euthanization, and then when you put down an animal out of compassion, I mean, they can't consent. And I know that, like, animal rights, human rights, like, that's still in debate for whatever reason. But, yeah, I mean, if, you're if an animal had been hit badly or was really sick, almost any vet would be like, put it up. So it's just interesting that we apply different rules to consenting and non-consenting beings. Yeah, so this was definitely the idea that the Nazis had in the Third Reich during Action T4 was that the <laughs> was that um was that the um was that the mentally handicapped or the physically handicapped they the Nazis were actually doing these people a service by ending their life. Um, and we assume the same thing with animals, that we're doing the animal a service. Now, there are loads of euthanasia rescue animals that you can find. You know, Just do a search for it online, and you'll find thousands of these, tens of thousands of these animals that have been saved from euthanasia. Um, now, there was, oh dear Lord, I don't know how real this is, um, but there was recently uh, a post online about um, uh, a woman who worked for PETA, um, and and uh, yeah, a woman who w worked for PETA, and and I'll, I'll say PETA actually believes in euthanization. So anyone who doesn't know, uh, PETA is an animal activist, uh, animal activism rights organization that fights for veganism. Um, but they also maintain that euthanasia is actually good. That there's an undue amount of suffering in stray animals, and maybe the best way to stop this suffering is by killing the animals that are already here. So instead of just releasing your pet into the wilderness or onto the streets if they're suffering, maybe the best thing to do is to allow the animal to die. Instead of reproducing more of these cats that are going to be suffering on the streets, maybe the best thing to do is to put the cat down using morphine, feeling no pain, just allowing the cat to die. The cat's going to die anyway. What's the difference? What's the difference? Uh, so this woman online made a post about uh, her uh, <laughs> PETA activism of the day, um, and she found out that her neighbor is blind and has a seeing eye dog. So the neighbor um, went into this woman's house stole the dog, had the dog euthanized. Felt morally justified in this action. So um, this is certainly what's referred to as involuntary euthanasia. Um, some people think that it's morally justified. Most of us consider it to be morally unjustified. Okay, um, yes? That's right. Okay, yeah, so the idea is that this animal, the seeing eye dog, was kept in captivity against its wishes. That the, the owner of the dog uh, was uh, impeding on the animal's right to just live freely. <sighs> but... Yeah, yeah, a any pet, any pet. Uh, well, she she might she might do it for literally every single pet. I think that this one was in particular because the animal not only was a pet but was also a slave. Um, and this the the animal was being used as a tool. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So it definitely uh, de definitely is uh, um, uh, based on perspective of different people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. So on that happy note, thanks a lot, Laura. Um, we're <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move on to our haiku and drawing contest. Thank you very much to everybody who participated. You guys are fucking awesome. These are really cool. All right, so we're gonna start off with our haikus. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, a haiku is five syllables, ba 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 ba, followed by seven syllables, ba 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 ba, followed by five syllables. <laughs> And then, uh, and then, uh, and then we're gonna take a look at the drawings. Okay, so uh, here is haiku number one. How'd I wish to go? I'd never thought, never had to make a deathbed. Number two, can I fly away without permission? Find peace. 
Truett? Relinquish. Ah, got it. Yeah. Can I fly away without permission? Find peace. Relinquish my life. <laughs> Remember that for next week, guys. Uh, okay, number three. You stop my heart like potassium chloride. Ten seconds till bliss. God damn. Adeen's not here, but I feel like that could be his. <laughs> All right, guys. So, uh, can we please get one big round of applause for everybody who participated in our haiku and drawing contest? Amazing. So all of your hands work. That's great. So I'd like all of you to participate in clapping at least a little for everybody. All right, but we're going to have a clap -a meter to see who wins this contest for a free drink. So, number one, never thought I'd had to make a, d uh, a deathbed. Okay? Number two, relinquish my life. And number three, potassium chloride. I'm going to give it to number three. There was less wooing, but I think there were definitely more clapping hands. Who uh, who, who wrote number three? Potassium Glory. Awesome. Thank you very much, man. You can go to the bar, get a, get a drink on me, whatever you want, okay? All right, cool. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, drawing number one. This is a two-parter. Sleeping's li just like Grandpa. They're cheating a little bit with the captions, but I'll allow it. There's Grandpa sleeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Andor. It's Andor. Not screaming and yelling like his passengers. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two. I hope that a shark... This is not a haiku. It's based on the drawing. Uh, no, no, no. I know it's a haiku, but what I'm saying is it's a part of the drawing contest. Okay. Uh, I hope that a shark takes a bite out of me and enjoys the meal, lol. <laughs> yeah, because we're poison. Uh, number three. <laughs> All right, guys. Round of applause for number one, please. Grandpa. <laughs> and number two. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And number two, shark teeth. Yes, that is number two. This, this one is a two-parter. It's a front and back. Same one. So this one says, sleeping just like grandpa, not screaming and yelling like his passengers. Yeah. Okay, let's re-vote. Let's re-vote. Okay. Number one, sleeping just like grandpa. <laughs> Number two, shark bait. <laughs> Number three. That's our winner. Who drew this one? Is that one? Oh, hey, beautiful work. You can go outside. You can get a drink on me, whatever you want, okay? All right, awesome. Brilliant, guys. All right. Now, you might know uh, Laura Hardy-Stewart. Everybody, that's Laura over there. Every week, she, uh, she spends quite a bit of time making a nice um, visual representation of the night's topic. Um, so this is her drawing for tonight. Um, she's experimenting with a new form. Normally, she's just had... Oh yeah. Normally she's just had um, one human form with a kind of blank background. Now she's experimenting with a kind of comic style. So you can think of this as being one pane, two panes, three panes. First an image of this girl in terminal care. Uh, the next, what she sees in front of her. You know, the, the beeping machines and the cards from her family. The pills in front of her and the water. And the last... Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this in the back there, but just in the center of her eye, the word well is burned in to her eye. Thank you very much, Laura. Round of applause for Miss Laura Hardy-Stewart, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for doing this for us, Laura. Um, if there are any musicians in the house, or if you know anybody that would ever like to contribute anything to the Hanoi Philosophy Forum, we have a little budget for it. So, uh, so yeah, let me know, and I would, uh, I'd love to chat with you about it. <laughs> okay, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk some about um, the legal status of euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide around the world. Then we're going to have a, a short talk on, um, on end-of-life directives, medical directives, um, and then we're going to call it a night. Uh, it is... All right, so let's go with it then. So um, we're going to start with Vietnam. So you guys might know, in Vietnam, euthanasia certainly not legal. Um, I love you too. Thank you very much for coming. I'll see you soon. Good night, guys. Um, yeah, so um, in, in Vietnam...
euthanasia, certainly not legal. Um, this is Nguyen Thi Bak Poet. Um, she's a retired 63-year-old uh, school teacher, and she was diagnosed with a very painful terminal illness. And since 1993, she's been fighting in Vietnam for the right to die. And she's really the one that's been igniting the uh, national debate on euthanasia laws in Vietnam. Um, one of the major things um, that, from, from what I was reading, wha one of the major arguments against legalization of euthanasia in Vietnam is the pain for the family. Unlike in the West, in Vietnam, you guys are so connected to your families. Um, and, uh, and it seems like whereas we in the West might be okay with pulling the plug on a family member, it seems like in Vietnam you could never imagine doing this. Um, one, of the big, uh, one of the big divides, and some politicians have even recognized this, but there are some politicians in favor of euthanasia, and it seems like the tides might be changing. Um, so this is Ding Ngoc Si. He's the president of the Vietnam Association Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, um, and he says that euthanasia may soon be legalized in Vietnam. He says that there are a lot of people who are currently chatting about this. Now, Dr. Nguyen Hui Quang, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, he's the director general of Legal Affairs Department for Vietnam's Ministry of health. And since 2015, he's been a vocal advocate um, for recognition of the right to die in Vietnam. So in 2015, the right to die, it was proposed to be included in the revised civil code of Vietnam. Um, it wasn't eventually included, um, but at least it was put in there by some politicians. They were fighting for this. So it seems like there are even more people within government who feel as though euthanasia should be a right of Vietnamese people. Now, um, uh, Kwong recognized uh, some of the problems with euthanasia. Um, one, again, being familial ties and familial piety here. Um, number two, he said it might, uh, unfortunately, be... Um, uh, it might be used for the wrong purposes. So again, if somebody has uh, an inheritance that might be coming their way, that the family might choose to euthanize a family member for the inheritance rather than to put them out of their misery. So uh, all of this being said, it seems as though, even though it's currently illegal in Vietnam, there still is national debate about this. Um, I don't uh, read Vietnamese, so my research was limited to articles in English uh, in Vietnam. Is there anything from anyone in Vietnam, that you, uh, any, any Vietnamese in the audience that you'd like to add to Vietnamese opinion of euthanasia? I did a good job. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, if anything comes up, you're certainly invited to shout it out. Cool, guys. Uh, so Kwong said, in reality, those suffering from serious and painful conditions untreatable by current medical capabilities do wish to die a peaceful and painless death, and I think they should be allowed to. Okay. So that's Vietnam. Now we can move to some countries in the West that have legalized uh, suicide or physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia. And first we can start with Switzerland. So first of all, euthanasia is illegal in Switzerland. Again, the distinction here between physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia is that with euthanasia, the doctor is the one that actually pushes in the syringe. He's the one that puts the pill in your throat. The doctor or she, the doctor is the one who's actually performing directly the murder of another person, the killing of another person. But in Switzerland, suicide is legal, period. Therefore, assisted suicide is legal. So doctors are able to give prescriptions for uh, pills that might kill the person. So as in 2014, there were 700, in Switzerland, there were 742 assisted suicides. 320 of these were men, 422 of these were women. Now these are very reliable figures, unlike some of the other figures that we have, because suicide is legal. So we really know these pretty, um, pretty firmly. Okay, now there were 1,029 non-assisted suicides. Um, 754 were men, 275 were women. Um, so the ratio of um, male to female, you might see that there are far more men committing suicide non-assisted, where it looks like in Switzerland, far more women, the ratio here again, um, when we're talking about assisted suicide, far more heavy on the female side, which is just interesting to consider why that might be. Um, it also appears as though um, we have 
have about uh, two-thirds the rate of physician-assisted suicide as there are standard suicide, which is huge, right? Um, that almost half the population that wants to commit suicide is doing so with the assistance of a physician. Okay. Everybody got that? Yeah. So there, so there are a couple ways. Yeah. So there are a couple ways that you can persecute someone for committing suicide. So number one, many people just don't want the last act that they do on Earth to be breaking the law. Um, this has to do with the death with dignity. I don't want my death to be an offense to everybody. I don't want my family to be embarrassed of the fact that I've died. I don't want to disgrace my family by breaking the law. Um, so I don't want to do something that's illegal. Right. So that's number one. Number two, there are many things that the state can do in terms of your burial. Um, they can control the way that you're buried, whether or not you get a religious ceremony. They can control whether or not if you have any money that you might be leaving to your family. In many countries where suicide is illegal, if you commit suicide, the state takes your money, right, rather than giving it to your family. So you don't get the punishment, but your family receives the punishment. And I guess, you know, indirectly you kind of get the punishment as well um, for committing suicide, right? Also, if you attempt suicide and you fail, you can actually go to prison in some countries. Um, I think it would be ironic if you get the death penalty. I don't think that's the case. Um, now, uh, in the United States, suicide is illegal in this way, but it's been 20 years or so since anybody has, ac or since any individual or any family has actually been tried for this. So even though it's illegal, um, that doesn't mean that people are actually being punished. Now, one thing to recognize here is moral issues that general populations tend to really follow legal guidelines uh, on opinions of issues. For example, um, <laughs> I don't want to get too personal here. Uh, some people are kicked out of their parents' house for smoking marijuana in America because it's illegal. Um, Maryland recently uh, legalized uh, cannabis use. Well, so now there are some people who are smoking marijuana with their parents who kicked them out of the house for smoking marijuana. Um, some people totally changed their mind on the issue of marijuana just because of its legal status. So some people might really change their moral um, conception of suicide because of the legality. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Um, so in Switzerland, most of the people who are, um, uh, I don't want to say committing, uh, most of the people who are um, undergoing physician-assisted suicide are elderly, and they're suffering from some kind of terminal disease. Um, there are euthanasia organizations, and they're used widely by foreigners. Um, this is something that's referred to sometimes as suicide tourism. So in 2008, 60%, I was wrong before, I said 20%, I was being conservative, I'm sorry. 60% of the total number of suicides in Switzerland, assisted by an organization called Dignatus, uh, had been from Germany. Okay. Now we can take a look at the Netherlands. Um, so you, uh, euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide have been legal in the Netherlands since 2002. But it had been a common practice for 20 more years before it was legally recognized. It was de facto legal, meaning even though it wasn't actually on the books, nobody had been tried. There was a case, I believe in 1993, where uh, a family had sued a physician for um, uh, helping a uh, patient perform suicide. Um, and it was after this case that, swi that the Netherlands uh, started to fight for the like on the books, real legalization of physician-assisted suicide. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, um, so in the Netherlands, according to law, a physician-assisted suicide is only legal in cases of, quote, hopeless and unbearable suffering, which, of course, is very um, uh, subjective, right? Um, and, uh, and they do allow both physical and mental causes of this, f um, of this hopelessness and unbearability. Uh, in many countries, uh, only the physical side is actually allowed. So in 2016, there were about 6,100 official cases of euthanasia. That's 4% of the total deaths in Netherlands. 4% out of 100 people in the Netherlands, four of them that died 
was from physician assisted suicide. It's huge. It's that's a huge number. Is that counting people who just die? Yes. Are we that's, counting like car crashes and murders? That's everyone. Okay. Yeah, that's everyone. Everyone that dies, 4%, um, died from physician assisted suicide. Now, in the Netherlands, um, overall, all over the world, after legalization, we see that there's an increase in the rate of physician-assisted suicide. In the Netherlands, it doesn't appear as though there's actually been an increase after formal legalization. It's hard to say, because maybe some things were underreported in the Netherlands before formal legalization, but there wasn't, uh, many physicians didn't know that what they were doing was not legal, um, so maybe they didn't um, uh, under, uh, Sorry, maybe they didn't uh, underreport their uh, cases of physician assisted suicide. Yeah, Clyde. No, I was just saying, probably because of the fact that it was seen as common practice for 20 odd years. Okay, so yeah. just the legalization didn't really change the press. Which yeah, right, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Do you know anything about the process? No, good, no, no, good. Do you the, know the, the process of how they decide whether it's legal versus and whatever you just said, or is it not? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't. I don't think that I have it on here. No, I don't. Um, no, I don't know. I don't. I don't know about the process in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, it's. It's not. It's not a simple thing. Um, in almost all of the countries where physician-assisted suicide is legalized, it's considered a last resort. Um, it's not as though you can just um, request physician-assisted suicide. First, you might go to therapy. Um, then you're going to get um, pharmaceutical care. Um, you might try this solution, that solution. And after all of these things don't work, then you can consider physician-assisted suicide. Now, of course, most of the time, if somebody's um, requesting physician-assisted suicide, you've already tried all of these things, and they haven't worked, right? But it definitely is uh, a, a lengthy process. In September 2004, um, there was something called the Groningen Protocol, which set out the criteria for child euthanasia. We'll talk more about this in, in a little bit. Um, in addition, in 2010, then, um, there was an organization called Out of Free Will, which started demanding the right to death for anyone who was 70 years or older and who was tired of their life. So the burden was no longer on them to claim that they had some kind of unbearable uh, pain and suffering. Instead, they just said, if you're 70 years and older and you're just sick of life, you're allowed to uh, you're allowed to die. Right now, there's currently a debate over people. Oh, this is insane. Okay, there's currently a debate with people who are shown to have the early signs of dementia. When they didn't have dementia, they signed a living will. They signed an end of life directive that said, "If I get dementia." I want you to perform euthanasia. So you might say, if I have to go on a feeding tube, kill me. If I need to be on a breathing tube, kill me. If I lose all motor function, kill me. If I get dementia, kill me. Well, there are many people who said, if I get dementia, I want you to end my life. Now that they have dementia, they're no longer saying that they want to die. They want to live. So is it consensual or not? So uh, this will just be a big group. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one, guys. So again, a person previously requested to receive euthanasia in the event of onset dementia. They filled out uh, a kind of end-of-life directive. Now, with early signs of dementia, the patient wishes to stay alive. What do we do? So surely one of the things that they're taking into account when they sign that is like what their treatment is going to affect their family over that case. And once they start suffering with dementia, they're probably dealing with a different, like, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like conflict, you know, with life. Um, so I think it's a bit, like, debatable, you know. Like, because from the early stage to the next stage, it would be like a massive, like, shift. Um, but yeah, pretty much... Great. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I was wondering if there's an argument about what you were talking about earlier, um, if someone's capable or has the willpower to end their own life, and we think if someone's mentally uh, well enough to make the decision whether they should, so someone that might be clinically depressed, for instance, maybe you can say that that choice whether they should stay alive or not is more biased because of the way they're thinking in that current time. So someone with dementia, by that point, they've lost some faculties that they normally had. So y there's an argument there. Well, do, do they? Ha I mean, do they have the same 
choice, uh, you know, the, the normal capability to make that choice when they've got limited faculties, perhaps. Yeah, and many are pe many many people are arguing no, they don't. Like this is exactly why they created this end of life directive, because when they have dementia, they won't be able to make this decision on their own. But they also know they don't want to live with dementia. I don't know if anybody here has experienced a parent or a grandparent go through dementia. Um, it's horrible. Um, it's different for every single person. Sometimes it's very livable. For some people, it is horrible. It is a state of fear and confusion and it's no way to want to live. There's no doubt that this anxiety and this fear and confusion is going to add to their desire to not be killed by doctors, right? Okay, all right. We're going we're gonna to touch on this one uh, again in small groups. Um, so in the United States, uh, federally, active use of euthanasia is illegal. That means when the doctor actually pushes in the syringe or feeds the uh, feeds the medication to the to the patient. Now, in in America, patients retain the right to refuse medical treatment. Right to say, pull the plug. I don't want to be hooked up to a ventilator or anything. Um, even if the patient's choices hasten their death. So this is what's called passive euthanasia. Right. Okay. Now, um, futile, that is, um, uh, systems that won't actually affect anything, um, tools that won't actually help anything, or disproportionately burdensome treatments, that is, like, something that's extremely expensive, you know, spending $600,000 just for an extra month of life, these might be withdrawn without the consent of the patient. These might be withdrawn by the hospital or by the insurance company in specific circumstances, especially when we see that there are just limited resources. Um, assisted suicide is now legal in Washington, D.C., in Colorado, in Oregon, Hawaii, Washington State, Vermont, California, one county in New Mexico, and it's de facto legal in Montana. That means it's not technically legal. It's not on the books as being legal, um, but uh, people aren't tried for it. It's not a criminal offense right now. Uh, sorry, it's not tried as a criminal offense uh, in Montana. Uh, in Australia... Euthanasia is also illegal, but individual Australian states have decided to legislate on the issue. Um, there were huge debates in Tasmania, New South Wales, and South Australia. They've debated over this issue, but uh, ultimately these have actually failed in 2013 and 2017. Um, I think this one should have been 2015, sorry. Um, the middle one, 2013, 2015, 2017. Um, patients, though, can, again, elect to have their life support turned off. This is the, the case in most countries. Okay, now, this is the last country that we're going to talk about. And then we're going to break into small groups for a last discussion. And then we're going to kind of call, call it a night, guys. I really appreciate you all sticking through. I know it's a pretty heavy topic. So in Belgium, they legalized euthanasia on the 28th of May in 2002. And right now, they're receiving about 1,400 cases a year. They hit a peak in 2013 with 1,807 cases. Um, according to a 2010 survey in Belgium, most of the people who were undergoing euthanasia were younger, they were male, and they were ca cancer patients. Um, and they, uh, uh, compared to the rest of people who died in Belgium, these people tended to die at home because they had the option. This is one of the real benefits of euthanasia. You get to die at home, surrounded by your family. Um, and mostly they were dying because of unbearable physical suffering. This is different than what we see in a lot of other countries, actually. Now, in December of 2013, Belgium extended euthanasia laws to terminally ill children. Quote, the patient must be conscious of their decision to understand the meaning of euthanasia. It must be approved by the child's parents and medical team. The illness must be terminal. There must be great pain with no available t treatment. A psychologist must determine maturity to make the decision. It must be voluntary as well. And in September of, of 2016, the first minor, that is under 18, was euthanized. Now, recently, um, the youngest person was euthanized ever in Belgium at nine years old who was suffering from a terminal illness. Okay. Before we break, um, 
because I, I, I want to I wanna get us out of here, I, I want to talk really quickly just about advanced medical directives, okay? Uh, I don't mean to just be switching around. I know that that was a little heavy. We are going to have a chance to talk. Um, but uh, I just want to say this is going to be really brief. Um, wherever people are on the side of this issue, everyone agrees on advanced medical directives. So this is also called a living will, a personal directive, advanced directive. These have a lo lot of different names, but it serves the same function. The idea is that you write down the way that you want to die. You write down the medical procedures that you are willing to have performed on you during the end of your life. Now, it's extremely important that everyone Everyone writes one of these down. Otherwise, there might be years-long battles about the end of your life. Um, maybe raise a hand. Does anyone in here have an end-of-life directive? Okay. Let's change that, guys. So what I, I, I'm going to do right now, uh, I'm going to post uh, an end-of-life directive form on the Hanoi Philosophy Forum Facebook group page. And what I'd ask of all of you is to fill this out, or at least have a conversation. Tell a family member the way that you would like to die, the medical procedures that you're comfortable having towards the end of your life. An uncountable amount of suffering to you and your family is possible to be avoided if we fill out one of these end-of-life medical directives. Okay? Any questions about any of that? Uh, it's it's pretty true. I mean, it's very true. There are, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I certainly can't say a hundred, but I. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm I'm glad your brother's not at this uh, event tonight. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I wish that he was here. But um, no, but I I I think it's true. I'm, I'm definitely not playing devil's advocate. Um, so there are lots of different organizations. I think, you can correct me, I've tried to do as fair of a job of showing both sides of the argument here throughout everything tonight. Thank you. So every single organization, whenever there's been a debate, um, <laughs> you, you'll, read, you'll read at the end of these debates where they'll say, both sides agreed that an end-of-life directive would have solved this issue. Right? It's amazing how consistent this is. Every moral problem, every philosophical problem, ethical problem, legal problem is solved with the use of an end-of-life medical directive. Yeah, true. So this, is, this is essentially telling people what you want, and I, I would think that maybe, John, what you're saying is that everyone wants other people to know what they want. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I mean, know. when I, I really boil it down. I actually disagree with you. <laughs> yeah, well, when I put it that I, way, I everybody agree. wants everybody to know what they want. Possible, yeah. So I would suggest maybe updating it once every five to ten years. Yeah, yeah. But at least if you were in a car accident or a motorbike accident today and were paralyzed or brain dead, it would be really helpful um, to have a, an end of life medical directive for your family and your physicians to follow. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. If anybody do, uh, does anybody have an argument to end of life directives? Yeah. Not an argument per se, but I was just wondering. If you have an advanced medical directive, right, and say the minute before you get into a car accident, you're like, oh shit, I need to update my advanced medical directive, but it's too late now because I'm in a car accident, I'm in a coma, then. Right. Well, it's certainly no worse off than if you didn't have an advanced medical directive. In the right. But then what if, like, you sign a DNR on certain procedures, but then you change your mind, right? Then. <laughs> well, stuff's going to be healed. I, 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 I agree that in that scenario, maybe it wouldn't be great for you. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, guys, there's a really big football match tonight. Um, so we're gonna call it. Uh, they need us out of here by about 11, um, and it's 10:17 now. So we do we do have quite a bit of time. So we're we're all right. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is turn us over to our our last discussion. Um, and that's based around um, this, uh, the last presentation on the different laws around the world. Um, so, and this is kind of wrapping everything up here. So, um, question number one, do we have a right to die? Should, this, should the government 
be restricted, uh, sorry, should this right be restricted by the government? Should the government be allowed to tell us that we don't have the right to die? Number two, at what age, and I, I really want a number here, I want you to come to a number, at what age should a person have the right to elect for assisted suicide? And number three, should euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide be permitted to only the terminally ill and mentally competent? Or if someone is just old, should they be allowed? Or if someone is just a human being, should they be allowed? Physician-assisted suicide, okay? Are there any questions about these questions? We're good? All right, so let's break up into our last round of physician-assisted suicide. Uh, sorry, of small group discussions. Jesus. And I'm going to... <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, I'm <laughs> thank you, Caroline. And I'm I'm going to post on the philosophy forum right now uh, that form that I, I'd love for you guys to take a look at. Okay, all right, guys. Uh, so that's that's gonna be it for me. Uh, I love you all. Hang out as long as you want to. Thank you very much. And good night. Stick around and discuss as long as you want. Goodbye, guys.